You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation, old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to vanupodcast.com. And now your hosts, Shane and Jason. Hey guys, Shane here. Welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. Uh, so just got a brief introduction for you today uh, for this uh, second installment of our Building the Second Realm series, uh, the philosophy and culture of the Second Realm. So first off, uh, if you want to uh, get the audiobook for Second Realm Book on Strategy, uh, you can get it for free uh, by signing up for a free trial through Audible ACX. Uh, you can do that via the link libertyunderattack.com. Uh, forward slash SR audio and as of today uh, and this is being uh, recorded on May 22nd um, yeah as of today you can get it on the LUA site uh, by visiting libertyunderattack.com forward slash SR audio 2 uh, so to get the to sign up for a free trial and get the audiobook for free libertyunderattack.com forward slash SR audio or to uh, to purchase from LUA directly libertyunderattack.com forward slash SR audio 2 uh, and I will put uh, all those links uh, at the show notes or you can just go to libertyunderattack.com forward slash second realm all those links are there and you can also get uh, uh, f- links to the uh, free uh, the free digital versions of hashtag agora um, second realm uh, and you can also get the link to uh, the paperback if you want to uh, get a paperback copy of the book as well so in this uh, episode, um, here's just a, yeah, a brief, uh, brief overview as, I, as I've done in the past uh, couple episodes. But uh, yeah, the philosophy and culture of the Second Realm was uh, the discussion today. Um, we started by uh, talking about uh, the dis- uh, distinction between the First and Second Realm and how most folks are in transitions, uh, shades of gray, uh, versus wholly either in the First or Second. Um, so uh, um, shades of gray versus black and white um, is uh, kind of uh, the way the discussion goes. And I should have mentioned this already, but uh, this was originally recorded uh, and released on January 22nd, 2018. Um, so yeah, January 22nd, 2018. Now, um, back to the overview here. Um, we uh, obviously uh, define our terms. Uh, we talk about the amorphous second realm. So, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, these temporal autonomous zones, they, uh, they appear and uh, then they uh, disappear uh, just as quickly as they appeared. <laughs> so uh, then we talk about uh, then we cover some uh, some excerpts from uh, the book on strategy on individual autonomy. So if we're talking about the uh, philosophy and culture of the second realm, uh, that is a uh, critically important concept. Uh, next, uh, the second realm down, uh, the second realm comes down to property rights. Um, that is ownership of oneself and the fruits of one's labor. Uh, we talk about uh, import export, uh, which is a, a Vanu concept, um, which is uh, the way uh, uh, which is the way Vanuans interface with the first realm. Um, well, that's uh, uh, the topic of discussion in uh, second realm book on strategy as well, because uh, we're talking about these uh, the, the, these two realms, one of freedom and one of servitude. Uh, so the way they interact is uh, crucially important. Uh, so uh, they talk about that. We talk about it as well, uh, and also the importance of keeping these two realms uh, separate. Uh, We talk about the parallels with indigenous cultures in communities. Uh, We answer the question and uh, kind of uh, discuss the possible answers. Uh, Could the second realm participate in assassination politics, uh, assassination markets? Uh, The Avenging Angels concept that uh, Rayo Rayo, uh, put out in his book, Following the Search for Personal Freedom, uh, and anarchist vigilantism. Uh, So are these concepts compatible with the second realm? Uh, Could individuals... Uh, in the second realm, uh, I guess, uh, consistently participate in such activities? Uh, it's a very, very important question, and uh, yeah, there's not really a clear-cut answer, I don't think. Uh, anyway, uh, next up, we, we talk about the parallels with the constitutional or colonial era, at least to some, uh, to some degree. Uh, we talk about technology in the second realm, because that's a very important concept, or I guess a very important connection. Uh, and uh, then we, uh, the, the last excerpt uh, we talk about, uh, that was the last excerpt we discuss uh, was second realm culture. Um, that is uh, art, creativity, symbols, and codes, etc. Uh, we discuss uh, privacy's critical role in the second realm because that's very much a part of the philosophy and culture um, of the second realm. It's a part of autonomy. It's uh, critically important. And uh, we kind of uh, conclude with uh, talking about uh, building each other up in the second realm uh, versus the, the constant tearing down that occurs in the survival society. So yeah, uh, another really, uh, you know, uh, I, I re-listened to it uh, this morning. I, 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 re- I re-listened to it and then I record these so it's still fresh on my mind. 
yeah, I I really enjoyed the episode, guys. Uh, I I really did. Definitely more positive than the uh, the philosophy and culture of the first realm. The last episode, uh, we talk about uh, good things uh, like freedom. And uh, again, I, I really appreciate a lot of Kyle's insights. And uh, I certainly hope you do as well. Uh, so just to reiterate, again, uh, libertyunderattack.com forward slash SR audio to get the audiobook uh, for free via Audible or ACX through a free trial. Or, or from uh, LUA, uh, the LUA website, libertyunderattack.com forward slash SR audio too. Or to get all this stuff for free, libertyunderattack.com forward slash second realm. I'll put all those links in the show notes. That's all I have for you today. I uh, hope you're uh, staying safe and staying liberated wherever you are. And uh, hopefully at, uh, hopefully somewhere, yeah, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, hopefully you're building uh, some sort of a second realm. You're organizing with individuals, uh, in the, uh, at, least, at least in the digital realm, because uh, everyone should be doing that. Um, but uh, in the physical, sp- in physical space and time, that, uh, that needs to be kind of the, the focus right now, uh, as we've talked about so much uh, in these past, uh, past episodes on the podcast. Uh, so that's all I've got for you guys. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, please enjoy, and uh, hope you hope you find this uh, this this content uh, as valuable as I do. Uh, so yeah, until next time. What is the philosophy of uh, of the second realm con- contrasted with the first realm? Uh, what role does culture play in it, and what might it look like? Uh, those are both questions that we'll answer uh, with our guide again being Smuggler and XYZ's Second Realm Book on Strategy. And yes, those are pseudonyms, uh, as you uh, as you can imagine. Uh, so Kyle, before we provide a uh, refresher on definitions here, is there anything you'd like to uh, to to bring up beforehand? Sure. You know, there's there's always been the issue about black and white uh, type thinking versus, you know, shades of gray thinking and all that. And while there is a distinction between the first and the second realm, there are also quite a bit of uh, folks who are transitioning from one to the other. And for them, the difference between the two realms is more shades of gray. In fact, a typical actually one descriptor was like during the day, they'll do their first realm job and et cetera, et cetera. But then pretty much once nightfall happens, almost like a Batman comic book almost, once nightfall happens, then they are into the second realm and they're doing all the stuff that they really care about, et cetera, et cetera. So, right, right. And, and the way that was presented in hashtag Agora, if I remember correctly, was um, so like they, they would do they would do what they did. And then at night they'd go to this uh, to this club where they'd have, you know, private access and yeah. uh, they would snort coke and get strippers and all the stuff that they couldn't do in the first realm, apparently. So, I mean, that's just mm-hmm. one one uh, one possibility for. Uh, for folks, or it may not be, but uh, but that's that's kind of how it is. It's two two separate realms, and it's very important to keep those separate. Yeah, and and that there are people who are kind of who are very much are part of the second realm, but they'll be stepping between the two. And then, of course, I think it, at least at this current evolutionary stage, there are a few folks who are pretty much virtually wholesale in the second realm, but that's not the norm. The norm, at least at this point in history, from what I understand, is that people are kind of jumping back and forth and between first and second realm. And the tendency is toward, at least I'm hoping it's toward the second realm. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting that uh, I mean, some people might be mean and call it controlled schizophrenia. I don't see it that way. I see it as people trying to wean, kind of like people who are weaning themselves off the welfare state and trying to become independent, trying to become more entrepreneurial, et cetera, et cetera. I think in some sense, people are trying to, who actually care about freedom and or liberty on some level, are trying to wean themselves off the first realm and all the safety, con- uh, convenience, and dare shall I say efficiency it may very well provide and try to get to something a little bit more uh, consistently wholesale, so to speak, with the second realm, something that actually respects their autonomy and, and so forth. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree. Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't call this controlled schizophrenia at all. I mean, um, it's obviously, uh, unfortunately, as, as, as far as we know right now, I mean, there aren't, there aren't any permanent t- temporary autonomous zones that, 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 that are second realm yet, as, as far as we know. Um, so, so obviously, people have to survive. Um, so, so yeah, they may, they may do some, some trading in the first realm and then, uh, you know, um, do, do some trading in the second realm too. But, uh, yeah, at this stage, uh, as you were saying, um, I, I think it's very much, uh, as Rayo discussed in, uh, in, in Vaughn of the Search for Personal Freedom, uh, there's very much a need for import export, which, uh, which will come up, uh, at least a uh, different terminology here uh, as we move forward in this episode. But, uh, anything else? I think that's a good way of putting it. It's it really is import export, and that that's kind of the bottom line here. So, all right, so let's do a quick refresher on definitions here. Um, so, second realm. 
Uh, and this is from uh, from the book Second Realm Book on Strategy. Quote: An updated version of temporary autonomous zones, TASs, essentially the ability to conduct trade and other activities, including vices, in certain areas at particular times, without reprisal from the state. TASs were originally conceived of as geographically mobile, like Vanu shelters, yet now it may include cyberspace, uh, such as the deep web. And the last portion of that wasn't uh, wasn't from the book, but uh, yeah, sorry for the, for the uh, for not making the distinction there. Uh, anyways, uh, so so yeah, that's that's uh, the second realm. Uh, so now with uh, with things like uh, the deep web and Silk Road and uh, I2P, the Internet Invisibility Project, uh, and things like that, I mean there are ethical enclaves or agoras opening up on the internet, uh, and those could also be considered second realms too. Um, now, uh, another definition we, we, uh, we talked about last week was individual autonomy, and this is uh, from the book, quote, The foundation for liberty is small is a small but powerful word. Autonomy comes from the Greek, Greek words autos meaning self and nomos meaning law. It refers to the ability, right, or wish of something to be governed by its own law. Anarchism is therefore not what the media tells us, but instead the presence of law chosen by those that are covered by the law, contrary to a law given by rulers to handle subjects, that each and every person has the right, that is morally justified, to be the final authority over the law he chooses for himself, and that anything that violates this right is a crime, end quote. Uh, and we'll, we'll get more into that uh, momentarily, but I'll, I'll stop now and uh, turn it over to you, Kyle, if you have anything to add. Yeah, sure. So... The kind of operational definition for a second realm is that, yes, it can include cyberspace, but it's not limited to that. For example, consider to go to a more uh, pop culture slash comic book fictional example, like anytime you have uh, your alleged superheroes kind of get together – uh, whether it's in an alleyway or, you know, not the official clubhouse, because that's leaning more towards like a PAS, a permanent autonomous zone. That's something different. But whenever they kind of get together and uh, or whatever, or they're at uh, a warehouse or whatever the setting is, sometimes those areas can be temporary autonomous zones, too. But then but then as is the uh, main characteristic of mobility, they then have to move their activities elsewhere. So that's kind of something, too, is that the second realm really is amorphous in terms of its uh, geography. So, for example, yeah, you could have like a block party uh, tonight, but obviously you wouldn't be holding it tomorrow night or even next week or next month, but you might do it again next year. Or right. at some other ir irregularly scheduled time and place because you're trying to avoid being oppressed by the state. Because obviously, if you have, and this is the one problem with like nightclubs, is that generally speaking, the standard model of a nightclub is that it is a singular place, usually a bar with a dance floor, um, that's you know at a certain address in a certain part of the city in this particular building, and it's always there. So, should the bludgies ever decide to raid a nightclub, it's kind of like, is anybody really surprised? As opposed to having nightclub events that are held at different places which are by invitation only and the guests are brought in uh using good security culture which may or may not include blindfolds which may or may not include encrypted communications etc and then once everybody's together then they can get together and party the second realm is more similar to the latter where it's an amorphous thing where people are kind of moving around convening together but then also dispersing only to then convene together again later. And it can either be a peer-to-peer one-on-one thing, or it can even in some case, in, in a lot of ways, can be a groupy, almost nightclub type atmosphere, or like an open market bazaar type thing. Um, so, I mean, e even something like a farmer's market, if it was held in like different parking lots on different days, depending on how openly advertised it was, if it was by invitation instead of, putting out an address on Twitter, which is about the worst thing you could do, right? Because the bludgies have access to that kind of thing, as does anybody else on the blasted planet. But if it was by invitation only, then that would be closer to a second realm, actually. Right, right. And something I did just think of, uh, at least in some ways, uh, freedom festivals are second realms of sorts. Like, I, I know when I've gone to the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest or, uh, or Anarchon in Virginia, 
Uh, it's very much a second realm type atmosphere. I mean, uh, trading without uh, with uh, without the, uh, the, the without the coercion of the state, you know, taxation. Um, there's uh, you know participating in vices, uh, you know, things that people don't really get to do, you know, the rest of the, the rest of the year. Uh, it's very much kind of that, uh, and I think that's why, uh, you know, for me and for others that have gone to these things, uh, you know, it's it's that one time a year, like it's it's that one time a year everyone looks forward to because it's 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 that's the second realm. I mean, that's you know actual freedom, being able to do with your body as you wish, uh, without uh, without the threat of the state. Uh, so. So yeah, for those of you who uh, you know want to conceptualize it in some way, I'd say a freedom festival is a, is a great way to do it. Uh, you know, if it's if it's like the two that I mentioned, as far as freedom conferences that may or may not be, uh, I guess that's just kind of depending. But uh, I, I really do think freedom festivals could be uh, um, could be at least uh, you know recognized as a, as a second realm uh, in, in in some sense. Or closer uh, closer to it, yeah. Closer, yeah, closer. Um, so. I guess let's go ahead and get into it here and get, I guess, get into the uh, philosophy of the second realm. Now, the first portion of this is individual autonomy, which uh, we've already defined that. Um, but uh, we will now dive into it uh, a little bit further and get some, some more explanation from Smuggler and XYZ. Quote, since the application of individual autonomy has these implied limits, and because multiple autonomous individuals can create conflicting laws, it is necessary to define the boundaries in which autonomy can exist. This sphere of autonomy is known as property. It is the physical boundaries in which a person is the sole source of law. It is physical because only physical interaction can limit the autonomy of another physical being. And it is necessary so that individuals have room to decide for themselves and know if their decisions are justified. Any attempt to deny the concept of physical individual property is an attack on the concept of, concept of individual autonomy. Both are interlinked inseparably in the universe we live in. This brings us to the second fundamental statement about liberty. Liberty is not pure independence or self-sufficiency, since most of us are unable to satisfy all wants solely by ourselves, and because our spheres of autonomy border, border upon those of others, we are required to interact with each other, mate, trade, socialize, etc. The only possible way to do this while preserving individual autonomy is to interact on a voluntary basis, meaning that everyone interacting must do so by his own will, and that the only acceptable interaction is one in which both parties parties agree fully. Any other interaction amounts to a violation of individual autonomy and must be considered a crime, end quote. So I think there's two important things to, to, to mention here at least. And the first one is that's, they're talking about import-export. Uh, they, they, they really are. Um, so, so yeah, as far as, uh, you know, as Rayo said, um, Vanu is not self-sufficiency per se. Um, so yeah, they, they kind of, uh, you know, recognize that, uh, that as well. And second, uh, you know, it all comes down to property, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of the fundamental here. And sorry, socialism and communists. I mean, it does come down to property. Uh, <laughs> you own yourself and, and you own the fruits of your labor and, uh, any, any infringement upon those things, uh, is a crime. And, uh, if, if the person believes in self-defense, uh, you might, uh, you might see that come at you. Uh, so I guess I'll turn it over to you, man. What do you have? Well, regarding the the passage you just you just read, you know, it kind of reminds me, and maybe I should have said this in the previous episode, but I'll do so now since I thought about it. You know, a lot of mainstream feminist academic literature that I read back in college mentioned constantly about autonomy, but they meant something different by it. Um, obviously, here autonomy means basically individualism in in some sense or another, right? It's this is there's no collective movement of any kind. Um, there's no identity politics, which of course the feminists are just but one flavor of. There's none of that. It's basically, you know, the the biggest, or should I say, the most notorious in some sense minority on the planet is of course the individual. Um, you know, uh, you know, it's not, uh, you know, it's not all the Jane Does in the world. It's that particular Jane Doe or John Doe or you know, fill in the blank, right? That that's that's kind of the point here. So regarding autonomy. It's, it's autonomy at its most fundamental level. So like when the feminists talk about autonomy, they're only really talking about women. So they're already playing the collective movementist game because they already have a boundary of who counts and who does not count in terms of autonomy because they're making all sorts of assumptions about males and, and such, which of course I, I largely disagree with. Um, here you're you're noticing you're you're noticing something much more different. In a lot of ways, actually in a more classical sense, the notion of individual autonomy is actually the really only truly humanit genuinely humanitarian approach 
to any sort of description of autonomy, period, because it's universal. You know, I mean, pretty much all human beings are individuals by the nature, by the, well, that getting too philosophical here, by the nature of their own existentiality, they are individuals, right? There is no we. You can't say we humans this, we humans that. Sure, there can be some, you know, superficial characteristics like two eyes, one nose, one mouth, you know, stuff like that. But other than that, you know, uh, individuality, you really have this, this flourishing of different tastes, different preferences where, yes, there can be trends uh, here and there, uh, but then there's also a lot of overlap and then there's odd, what some people would consider to be odd combinations of tastes and all that. And that's all, that's all part of individuality too, right? It's pretty much a limitless tapestry. So when it comes to an individual autonomy, it makes sense why the authors of, of this strategy book essentially were mentioning that is that there had to be a baseline of understanding about human nature is really what they're getting at here. And the baseline is you have to be autonomous because if you're not, then anything else they talk about is really just fluff, really. And even when they get to the more uh, nuts and bolts, pragmatic, um, you know, like the like the secret trading floors or or uh, double blind uh, booths or whatever else they mention elsewhere in the book, which we'll cover in other episodes. This is the individual autonomy is the baseline. That is that is the must have, if you will. So, yeah. yeah so if in and if you don't have that, then the rest of this is just it's just kind of nonsensical. Right, right. I think another important thing to mention here is when when autonomy when individual autonomy is infringed upon, uh, it's 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 crushing to the spirit. It really is crushing to innovation. It's crushing to, um, I guess I guess uh, uh, I guess just us as basic human beings to to you know use a collectivist term there. Um, I'll mention it again in a lodging of uh, wayfaring men, and this isn't a spoiler at all. It's something that's. Uh, that uh, I, I think most of us, most most people listening to this podcast and you and I call are, are well aware of. But when people are, uh, you know, held down, uh, well, like if you look at the, the most communist and socialist countries, um, innovation is definitely quilled. Um, you know, if you look at some somewhere like North Korea, uh, yeah, there's not a whole lot of innovation there. They aren't allowed to innovate at all, and uh, therefore, you know, as it's been going around the news cycle, uh, that's why that place is kind of a shithole. It's because uh, there is no individual autonomy. There is no ability for people to use their creativity to uh, turn raw goods into producers goods there's there's nothing there's there's nothing like that uh, except for kind of the black and gray markets but uh, you know that we're talking about uh, you know small numbers there uh, most people you know don't uh, you know, most people are you know very patriotic and uh, you know they they want to to obey the law and such or the very least or the very or the very least cowed by uh, cultural norms considering that portion of the world you or know, anthropo fear, or fear, anthropologically speaking fear, fear and intimidation too by, by by the state obviously but but i think what um what, what you'll see in the in the second realm if you if you haven't already i mean this would be um like in a lodging of wafering men they're uh they're free uh free digital econ uh, free digital economy uh is uh, what they call the fde um when you when you see people when when there when there are no restrictions, there are no regulations, there is no taxation, and there's more capital investment to work with, um, you will see hu human innovation and creativity flourish. And that's why you know even though even those second realms, I mean, this is kind of a new idea, um, at least in some sense. Uh, well, I guess it's not really a new idea uh, in, in, in some respects. These have existed throughout history, but as far as it being uh, a, a strategy for libertarians and anarchists, it, it, I guess it is to at least to some extent. So I, I guess the point here is that uh, uh, it is it is kind of new for libertarians and anarchists, but at the same time, when human beings are allowed, or when human beings are, are, are doing what they do best, and you know, innovating and, and innovating and being creative and coming up with uh, with, with solutions to problems, uh, I think uh, you, you know, second realms uh, are definitely places of uh, <laughs> definitely you know flourish, definitely flourishing, whether it's cultural, economic, or, or whatever. Well, of course, there has to be an outlet for creativity, for trade, for exchanging much of anything, whether that be keeping the lines of communication open or the flowing of goods or good old fashioned socializing, just, you know, recreational type stuff of one flavor or another. Because if there is no interaction, what I liked about this book in general was that it was constantly stressing about, you know, humans are social animals 
But then you have the state, which basically tries to take that element of human nature and really twist it in on itself. So therefore, how do you maintain a good, dare shall I say, a good balance between preserving individuality, shall we say, individual autonomy, alongside cultural norms? And this book is basically the single best explanation of how to pop quite strategically how to go about doing just that. Because I've never read a book like this ever. So this is actually very unique from from you know the various uh, book reports and other stuff I've mm -hmm. written. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So let me read one more paragraph, then we can discuss further. Uh, quote from this: It follows that even a temporary delegation of decisions to others and any kind of contract or law we chose for choose for social groups must be unanimously consensual by all parties delegating or receiving delegation and all parties joining a group or forming a group that another joins anything not meeting the standard violates individual autonomy where no such consent can be achieved the conflicting parties may only end their interaction and separate and quote that's kind of what you're just getting to or what you're just talking about is that when it comes to a second realm basically obviously people can people can do as they people can do as they wish uh, you know, the, I, I, I envision, you know, many second realms, many Vani, many cultures, all that good stuff. Um, so there, there may be different, uh, different, uh, I guess, standards with each one, but uh, the baseline for all of, for, 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 I guess, for, for all of these. And uh, I'd say the, I guess the, the, the only rules, so to speak, that there would be um, is, uh, yeah, I have respect for property rights, uh, whether that's the, the individual or the fruits of their labor. Um, and everyone must agree to that. And if they don't agree to that, then, uh, well, you know, well, you know what? The door hits you on the ass on the way out. Uh, exactly. Of all society. Yeah, exactly. And one thing that I really liked about the emphasis regarding unanimous consent is that it's very undemocratic. Wait, let me say that one more time in case everybody just missed that. Actually, I'll go ahead and up the ante. Not only is it undemocratic, it's actually very, in a lot of ways, anti-democratic, which I'm a big fan of because I don't like democracy as a form of government or forms of government since the official mainline political science literature has like 20,000 different flavors of democracy, each one more horrible than the last. Um, you see, at least with a monarchist form of government, the buck stops somewhere, right? It stops with the monarch, the king, the queen, the sovereign, right? The buck stops somewhere so that when there's a tyranny, you know who to point the finger to. In a democracy, you don't get that. Uh, with your hypothetically limited government, you don't get that because responsibility is diffused. At least with a monarchy, at least you know where the tyrant is, or at the very least, the buck stops somewhere, even if the tyrant is somebody else, not the king. Um, the nice thing about the second realm, though, is it kind of transcends all of that, all those various forms of government, by basically saying that, look, it's all about the individual and what their choices are. And as long as their autonomy is respected, then whatever goes, goes. Even if the majority, even if your democratic mob is in favor of something completely different or even antithetical to what a particular individual, or shall we say, the minority of the individual wants. And see, that is another lie of democracy of any flavor, whether it be a constitutional republic or anything else, even a Greek democracy, Greek-style direct democracy, so-called, is that each one of them claim in various different ways that, oh, our form of government, our particular democratic republic fill in the blank, is all about protecting the rights of the minority. Lie, lie, big fat lie. Whether you go, whether you look at it philosophically or you look at it, you know, in a more practical historical lens in terms of what actually happened, you know, uh, in history and so forth, that's not what it is. What actually is, is that the majority at least tries. Sometimes they win, sometimes they not, but they really try hard to rule the minority, and and the rights of the minority be damned. And then worse, then you have the emergence of special interests lobbyists and all that kind of stuff where basically everybody takes turn these collective movements like rayo mentioned these collective movements basically take turns sometimes the majority but then next election cycle they're the minority and so on and so forth next thing you know you have a two-party political system which is the eventual result of all of that mm -hmm. but it was only possible it was only possible because the baseline was a uh, democracy or a democratic republic or something of that flavor, some sort of majoritarian, uh, like winner take all type thing. The second realm is completely antithetical to all of that because, and let me bring in another fictional example. In 
El Neil Smith's The Probability Brooch, right toward, not to spoil the ending, I'll just give a little snippet, but it's relevant here. It was actually postulated, what if Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence was slightly reworded where it required the unanimous consent of the governed instead of just the consent of the governed? No, 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 no. The unanimous consent of the governed. Would think would history have turned out differently? And then, of course, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> well, uh, no. Well, maybe. Well, maybe Smith, through his characters, were being a little optimistic. The presumption was yes, it would have turned out dramatically different. You know, the whiskey rebels would have been successful instead of actual history where they failed, and so forth. Um, obviously, with fiction, there is it's all about hypothesizing, in some sense or another. But suffice it to say. Regarding the second round, this real world book on strategy and so forth, where it's mentioning about unanimous consent, by insisting on unanimous consent, I personally think a lot of problems are being avoided instead of, well, this election cycle will just, you know, we'll just, or if you don't call it election, call it something else. But during this particular cycle of decision making, uh, you lose out, but then, but then on the next one, then you may win. See, that's the other problem with democracies and all that is that it's always win-lose. With the market, which is what the second realm is based on, it is unanimous consent. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, hell, e even why yeah, there's, there's two parties to a transaction. If, if it's uh, if it's not beneficial for both, it won't happen. So, yeah, it's, it's certainly unanimous consent on well, both well, sides. Well, even at my warehouse job, I mean, just to use a real world example, I mean, the customers place orders and then and then the orders have to be, uh, you know, you know, assembled and then delivered. So and if the customers don't want anything, then obviously the orders don't come in and, and all that. And and last time I checked, it's all voluntary. Right. Nobody's putting a gun in their head and, you know, the company isn't insisting they pay a tax or whatever else. Right. You know, if they want to get like their groceries delivered to them or whatever else. Um, or computers or, or a lot of the other stuff the company sells, it's all voluntary. Last time I checked. And if it wasn't voluntary, I would have quit a long time ago. <laughs> so, because uh, I will only tolerate corporate America only up to a point. Well, if it, um, if it, if it wasn't voluntary, then you probably you might not be able to quit, but I get what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, well, that's my point. And so, and so for people who, uh, usually the minarchists, the people who believe in limited government for whatever strange reason, even though they sometimes might mean well, you know, it, it's kind of like, OK, so you're going to fight and die for the Constitution allegedly because you're OK with a limited form of coercion as long as it's spelled out in the allegedly supreme law of the land, which itself is an expression of a monopoly on the practice of law. Really? And and even bringing up something like privatizing law doesn't even come up. It's 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 unspoken even as a possibility. Because, I mean, hell, these are the same people that freak out whenever anybody brings up about privatizing the roads, never mind privatizing the legal profession or having multiple different forms of overlapping legal jurisdictions like was the case back in the Middle East um, you know, a couple centuries ago. So that's kind of the problem is that there's a lot of different things that either have worked or could work, um, but they're not even allowed to even be brought up even, even in conversation. And the nice thing about the second realm is that they are explicitly, the authors are explicitly mentioning about unanimous consent, which is much more in accordance with how the market actually works. Yes, yes. Um, so let's go ahead and move forward here. Quote, on the one hand, liberty is the fundament to our humanity. It is what leads us to self-motivation, self-determination, but it is also what allows us to interact ple pleasantly with others. Liberty is peace. Not a peace based on threats of mutual annihilation or cowardice, but instead founded on what makes us special as humans. Liberty is what gives us the room to become more human, to live in accord with our ethical and moral beliefs, to, prog to progress, to be in peace with others. In short, one cannot be fully human with al without also being in liberty. Uh, end quote. And obviously, uh, Rayo had a different uh, definition of liberty, but for, for, for the sake, I think it's, 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 it's appropriate. We know what they're meaning. Uh, we know what they mean by it. But yeah, I think that just kind of uh, further elaborates their position and, and, and kind of our discussion thus far. Let me just add an addendum to what I was saying a moment ago, because I think this dovetails in nicely. Imagine, if you will, <laughs> if, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of use some economic principles here, but there's no money being exchanged just to keep, just to kind of shift people's perspective a little bit. Imagine, if you will, if how dating as it actually works here culturally in North America, imagine if dating, which technically is free market in how it works, 
even though there's arguably no money being exchanged. Imagine if dating worked alongside like how decisions are made by government through our wonderful democracy, right? So imagine if you have like um, a woman or a man, straight or otherwise, basically having their lovers being chosen for them by a majority of either extended family or platonic friends or just actually probably most accurately would be a complete bunch of strangers they never met. Now, if that's actually how some people might try and make dating work, nobody would stand for that. Yet, politically, that's exactly what happens with regarding a lot of stuff in the first realm, whether it's roads or so-called taxes or whatever else. And so it's very interesting for me to watch people in certain areas of their lives that are truly privatized, like romance, um, people are a okay with that. They're fine, you know, dating without rulers dictating to them that oh, you should, you should only court this person but not that other person because they're not of your of your social class or five thousand other million reasons they're not of the same religion or whatever. Uh, sometimes even outright bigoted, like not even same skin color or whatever. Um, but generally speaking, at least culturally on this continent, it's not like that, as far as I'm aware of. Uh, it's pretty much free market, you know, whatever goes, goes, right? As long as everything's consensual, you know, as long as it's not the big R, then then whatever goes, goes, pretty much. Um, but oh no, oh no, <laughs> if it comes to <laughs> if it comes to certain things that the state would like to handle through, uh, through public policy, oh, we're not trying to dictate to you how to live your life, it's public policy, then, well, the, obviously that's that's the first realm. That's the first realm, and anybody who wants to say, hey, Maybe I should just have – maybe my individual autonomy should be preserved. You know, if, if my individual autonomy is respected when I'm, you know, dating, you know, romancing whomever or being romanced or maybe even doing both at the same time, um, you know, equality and all that little, little tongue-in-cheek there, then maybe if it's already like being in the second realm in some sense, then why can't the rest of my life, other elements of my life – uh, also be in the second realm, that's when your authoritarians really kind of start going into controlled schizophrenic mode. And that's very interesting. So they'll tolerate, you know, or let me put it a different way. Well, maybe not they, controlled. <laughs> well, I mean, they, they, they love the anarchy they live, but they don't like contemplating the anarchy they don't have, to put it, one, to put it, a, a, to put it a little bit more slightly risque way. Um, it, and it is, and it is controlled schizophrenic. It's like, oh, well, we have to have rulers and a monopoly government laws and basically the first realm for some elements of the human experience, but for other elements of the human experience, oh, it's just, you know, as long as it's consensual, ha you know, have at it, kids. And it's like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> if that's what children are learning and then as they grow up into teenagers and then finally, uh, hopefully fully formed adults, what kind of consistency or integrity is to any of that? At least with the second realm, there is at least an attempt at ends means consistency with individual autonomy being the baseline. You know, laissez-faire has to mean something. It's not just an economic prescription. It's also a social attitude. Live and let live translated into English, you know, basically. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know how else to put it. It's just quite fascinating to me that that in some ways some people kind of haven't figured this out and i'm really happy that these guys wrote this book to try and explain it as simply as they could yeah yeah i think it's uh it can be summarized by that uh that last sensor that we read uh, in short one cannot be fully human without also being in liberty i think that's uh that's quite profound for uh, for a lot of reasons uh, some of which we've uh, we've discussed so far so I guess let's go ahead and move forward here, and uh, this portion of the book is called First Implications. Quote, the ethics of individual autonomy have consequences for the culture of the second realm and the interactions we have with the first realm. Uh, end quote. So now we're going to get into, I guess, kind of the, uh, uh, so in the second realm, uh, you know, we as individuals recognize our autonomy, and uh, we we act as such. You know, we, we may participate in vices, we may, uh, we you know, we trade without the coercion of the state involved. Uh, you know, we do all of these things. Now, wh what happens when, when the first realm comes into play here? Let's, uh, let's find out. Quote, we do have to respect the individual autonomy of first realm persons, and even the decisions they have foolishly delegated to institutions and governments beyond their control. This does not mean that the resulting systems are ethical, but they are the will of the many. 
It is thus not for us to take down those systems, but rather to offer ethical alternatives to open doors into the second realm where people can fully embrace their humanity through liberty. This is required for several, several reasons. First, it allows us to keep the moral high grounds. While this is not a reason in itself, it justifies our position and shows respect to the individuals on the other side, reducing emotional opposition against the second realm. Second, it is necessary to preserve the ethical integrity of the second realm. Michael Gaddy said, quote, the battlefield of freedom is littered with the bodies of those who believe in compromise, end quote. Uh, compromising on our ethical foundations in relation to the first realm will also, uh, will also taint these foundations within the second realm. This calls us to keep the peace with the first realm as long as it is up to us to not intervene in the first realm to radically keep the two realms separate. There is no place for standoffs, end quote. Uh, so obviously they'll elaborate there, but I think that's a very important first uh, discussion point. Uh, and I think some political crusaders and controlled schizophrenics might not like that too much, uh, considering, uh, you know, they tend to uh, uh, like to change the system from within, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, make the government, uh, you know, fit their preferences instead, even uh, even if, uh, you know, it may benefit, uh, you know, people uh, as a whole through through the through, I guess, more personal autonomy. But at the same time, uh, as I said, uh, you know, these two. Uh, it's extremely important to keep the two realms separate. Uh, you know, second realmers don't interfere with the first realm, keep the peace, and, uh, you know, hopefully vice versa. Uh, but uh, obviously the violence will come from, from, from the first realm uh, if, if, if from anywhere. Um, so I think that's a, a pretty major first discussion point. Yes, and um, sorry, something you said reminded me of something that should be mentioned. There is an element of segregation here which is important to mention however it also needs to be properly understood this is not the equivalent of the statist you know jim crow laws where the state is basically forcing segregation nor is it the allegedly opposite pendulum but really in the same vein of coerced integration which was the authority the equally equally right equality is fine as long as we're all equally enslaved uh, the equally, uh, you know, coercive integration of the so-called anti-Jim Crow laws or whatever, or by now there's busing and, and all of that kind of stuff. No. The main thing here is all about voluntary association, right? The people who want to associate with each other will associate with each other, and the people who don't want to associate with each other won't associate with each other because, again, the baseline is individual autonomy. And some people are going to be multicultural, and other people are going to, and other individuals are going to be more uh, homogenous based on whatever uh, set of uh, characteristics, whether superficial or otherwise, is important to them. And this is something that the first realm really does not understand because they their baseline is coercion, period. And then anything after that is is basically them forcing their preferences on onto us or onto other or onto each other and and so forth. That's that's kind of the first thing I want to mention. So there is there is a distinction of private property borders, amorphous borders in the sense of the mobility and the temporary autonomous zones and all that, but there are still borders. In some sense, sure. that that's kind of something to keep kind of keep in mind, uh, and and all that, you know. And it's also kind of fascinating to point out that respecting the first realmers in in at least in some sense, I mean that that's kind of import export to some degree, right? You're, it's kind of that one that w I'm trying to think what the phrasing was the one what the one directional isolation. Yep. 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 Yeah, and and in a sense, that's actually a form of self-defense. Uh, in in some sense, not not in the you know, well, I have to shoot, I have to kill him before he kills me type of thing, but more in a self-preservation kind of context. And you know, any any type of I don't want to say tribe, but any sort of indigenous people who have found themselves at the boot, uh, have you know, basically getting squished by the boot of empire, can kind of understand the necessity and the desirability for self-preservation even as a culture. Uh, and so in a sense, they, in a lot of ways, of the various indigenous folks around the world who have been able to preserve their cultural norms despite um, alleged civilization knocking on the door or bombing them to hell or smallpox blankets or whatever else, I think even they can kind of appreciate that they too have had to use some some degree of private property borders just to keep themselves cohesive, if not just straight up, you know, good old fashioned survival and all that. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that the first realm 
is inherently imperialistic, and it has to be, whether explicitly in a practical sense or even implicitly in a cultural sense. I mean, even the whole notion of cultural assimilation has to be treated with some degree of delicacy, because you could be talking about something that's actually kind of not really a big deal, or you could, could be talking about something that's actually quite insidious, depending on the context. With the first realm, in, in the sense of Hmm. The first realmers want their culture to be assimilated by the the indigenous in some sense. Uh, that's kind of a problem. Uh, you could say, to use a historical example, you could say that when the British Empire was warring against the various Celtic peoples, including the Irish, uh, essentially that first realm of the British Empire was trying to absorb the Celts whom they, I guess, would consider like some version of a second realm, not exactly, but close closer to that and try to uh, kind of bring them in. And now we have the current political situation of Northern Ireland and all and all that kind of mess, um, you know, and, and there's all that. So, and I would suggest kind of something similar here, right? Um, you basically have, you know, there was that whole war between the states thing, which was not just so much a political thing, it was also a cultural thing because, you know, the Northern Yanks are not the same as Southerners, who in turn are also not the same as Midwesterners. And then, of course, you have the left coast, which might as well be its own country in some sense. Um, I mean, hell, um, Albignon Seed uh, by David Lee Fisher, that was actually a fascinating book whose main thesis was that America was originally this, this portion of this uh, North American continent was actually settled by four different types of – four different peoples. So the problem with the first realm is that it's constantly assuming that there has to be this unicultural, monolithic uh, thing you have to be a part of. The nice thing about the second realm is is that it's much it's much much closer based on on a market dynamic, right? Uh, people can choose to associate with each other in whether it's a commune type situation or even or some other sort of lifestyle arrangement. But it's all voluntary. Uh, people can disassociate at any time, and they can also reassociate if they if they should so choose. So ostracism is the main enforcement mechanism, and if you have a trader who uh, treats his customers badly, or even in a more social context, just treats other people badly, then obviously that guy's not going to get any potential spouses if we're talking in issues of, in terming of romance and families and stuff like that. So it, it cuts in multiple different directions is what I'm trying to say, because individual autonomy for the umpteenth time is the baseline. And the first realm does not respect individuality at all, because we have to be part of this great amorphous empire of, of whatever kind, instead of acting more like close at least in some cultural sense more like indigenous folks who basically just trade with each other all right so so this i guess this passage that we just read uh not treating as like the bible or something um but uh <laughs> <laughs> it uh brings to mind uh episode number three of the series uh when uh, jason booth and i talked to ben stone on the subjects of uh, assassination politics anarchist vigilantes and avenging angels now Obviously, what we just read, uh, you know, uh, keep the two realms separate, and uh, you know, uh, uh, second realmers let the first realmers have their uh, have their, I guess, culture and society. Uh, you know, uh, second realmers just separate. So, as far as uh, I guess, assassination markets, uh, anarchist vigilantes, and uh, well, I guess, avenging angels doesn't really play into it uh, too much. Um, so, I guess we'll just stick to those two. Um, I guess the, the overall question is, uh, you know, would uh, the the formation of assassination markets by folks in the second realm would that be i guess uh, an intrusion onto the first realm um now i'll i'll provide my answer first and uh then i'll turn it over to you so obviously self-defense when it comes to personal autonomy self-defense is uh, obviously crucial it's obviously important you need to defend yourself and uh, uh and your property so when it comes to assassination markets, I mean, uh, uh, the people that uh, you know would would get the most uh, would, would have the most uh, bets on them, uh, they uh, you know their influence is wide and it affects a lot of people, uh, whether it's through uh, war, taxation, vice crimes, et cetera, et cetera. So I would argue that uh, second roamers are, uh, you know, I, I feel like assassination markets would be, uh, I guess, uh, a means of self-defense. Uh, I, I think so. I think so at least. Um, and as far as anarchist vigilantes, uh, that may not actually be something that second realmers should participate in now that I'm looking back on it. Uh, <laughs> sure, it could help uh, promote the second realm, but uh, and, and you know, some folks may appreciate it in the first realm if uh, you know, anarchist vigilantes are apprehending uh, actual criminals. 
but uh, at the same time, I, I I don't know if that would actually be a a, 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 a uh, <laughs> something that the Second Realm should do. Uh, now that I'm thinking about it, but what, what do you think? Uh, assassination politics and uh, anarchist vigilantes. Uh, do you think that's an intrusion upon, uh, you know, that first realm society? To be fair, this is a very debatable point. I'm glad you brought up the question. Um, there's only so much that I think can be logically extrapolated uh, a priori, and I think most of the answer to your question is going to be a posteriori. We're just going to have to have history play itself out, and hopefully, if enough people became uh, vigilantes and or avenging angels and or whatever else, then hopefully we'll actually arrive at an answer empirically at some point. A priori, I'll give you my answer now, uh, just based on my own observations and such. At bare minimum, I think the avenging angels are perfectly acceptable because they are I really agree. about as, they're about as purely defensive as it gets. And again, as we've mentioned on previous LUA episodes, their main function is applying Pavlovian psychology to the state because they are, in some sense, trying to rescue a particular individual who's uh, rotting away in a government dungeon. So, you know, basically, uh, the Schumer has hit the proverbial fan for a purse for an individual who is now a bona fide political prisoner. And the goal of the Avenging Angel is to either liberate them or uh at, or failing that uh, attain some degree of justice um and that and that's just bare bones what it is regarding the other two the vigilantism could be that's really contextual uh the vigilantism could be directed towards preserving the second realm and like shall we say a private sector version of policing the border so to speak uh or otherwise providing security during import export activities um i would say probably the vigilantes is one of their more important roles would actually be providing security services for the proxy merchants yes yes that would be that would arguably one of the be one of their more important roles because you just simply can't trust the state and those proxy merchants if they're not careful are going to be um uh, especially if there was a lackadaisical security culture, or they were just outed through no fault of their own, or whatever the scenario is. And, and by the way, then what's, and, and, what's the by, fallback? By the way, in uh, lodging of wayfaring men, there's proxy merchants. But uh, of course, well, well, of course there are. <laughs> I'm not surprised. But yeah, like if. But what I'm saying is that if the proxy merchants get in trouble, but they're not political prisoners yet, then I think the vigilantes would definitely play a role in that. And even if they did become political prisoners. The vigilantes could team up with avenging angels and or they be the same thing or some sort of degree of overlap and then we're kind of back to that again so the vigilantes can kind of go either way um you know the more the somewhat more aggressive vigilantes where they're deliberately taking on the state would probably not be appropriate because the the degree the degree of limitation on the activities of second realmers in relation to the first realm is already explicitly stated here, right? The whole point is not to change the first realm. The whole point is to preserve and develop the second realm despite the first realm. That's kind of the whole point. So if the vigilantes are trying to bring the status to justice because they committed the twenty thousandth awful tyrannical thing this week, I guess bully for them, but that doesn't really have anything to do with the second realm at that point. Maybe there could no. be a tangential benefit, maybe, but that's really stretching credulity at that point. Now, regarding the third one, your assassination markets. <sighs> Unless there was like an extreme situation where the entirety of the second realm was under dire threat, but that doesn't even make any sense because the very concept of a second realm is amorphous and mobile anyway. You know, if the second realm was more of a permanent autonomous zone or a private city or something, then OK, then an assassination market would be kind of on the table. Um, but that's not what the second realm is, definitionally speaking. So therefore, the necessity and or desirability and or the philosophical basis behind an assassination market acting on behalf of the second realm, I personally just don't see it. Um, I could be proven wrong if something happens in, let's say, the near future, uh, shall we put it, and maybe there could be a bound. But as far as I can see it, it's avenging angels primarily, and then secondarily or peripherally would be some of the anarchist vigilantes, depending on their activities. And then mm. I, I would I don't really see a role for assassination markets because the whole point of assassination markets are to actively go after 
it's not even so much the first round. They're actively going after the state and and uh, whacking <laughs> to use <laughs> to use the organized crime lingo, uh, and and whacking off the although that sounds wrong in a different context, right? <laughs> but basically whacking off the uh, the bureaucrats, judges. Um, other other status and authoritarians of various flavors, maybe even some K Street lobbyists, as uh, Rand Paul would call them, and so forth. Um, so the assassination, uh, the the jackals who uh, either work independently or in conjunction as part of an assassination mark, as there's different versions and flavors. Uh, they they are just, I mean, I mean, I guess a better question is how are they not revolutionaries in some sense, but they are actively they are actively using force against the state. Um, because they are right. they're trying see, to take the, it down and, and the thoughts and the thought that came that that came to me is uh okay so you know say there are second realms in in, in the middle east and uh and there's there's word of uh you know uh obviously there's word about all of this stuff but uh if, if there's a uh, i guess uh an impending threat so to speak um that could you know seriously affect the second realms well you know it'd be a lot easier than starting assassination market or, mm. or utilizing that just leave That'd be the easiest thing to do. Well, sure. Uh, so, so yeah, I guess, I guess, so I guess I could see the viability of uh, anarchist vigilantes, uh, and I, sp I, I definitely could see the role of avenging agents. I don't think there's really any conflict as far as you explained it with either of those two, but, but yeah, I guess uh, assassination markets should be left towards, uh, I guess, the the first realm or revolutionary, so to speak, uh, or or I guess the the second realm. Uh, no, that wouldn't work either because uh, the idea is to keep these separate. So. So yeah, I think that kind of answers uh, answers that question. And let me let me add an addendum. The authors in the book on strategy mention about you know there is no place for standoffs. That's very very important because there are certain uh, folks and ideological adherents who shall go unnamed here who are very much in <laughs> favor of what uh, would more accurately be described of as civil defiance. And civil defiance as a concept is pretty much mm, arguably one or two steps away from full-blown revolutionary, you know, put the blood Jesus nine feet, you know, six feet under type of thing. Um, because it's all about, uh, it's basically trying to reenact Lexington and Concord, at least in some sense. Um, at least up until the point of the shooting, maybe even including the shooting, depending on on, interp on personal interpretation and so forth. So civil defiance is really about confronting the bludgies head on. I mean, it's not. It's. Not, I mean, e even if you were to bring up Vanu, it's not even Vanu at that point, because you're not mm -hmm. about, you know, that related concept. It's not about even trying to gain an invulnerability to coercion. No, you're directly confronting the initiators of coercion, and you're basically kind of tempting them to, like, you know, and and then it just, it's. You know what? You know what civil defiance really is? It's a game of chicken. It's a game of chicken, and then it's really like he who blinks who will fire first. first. Well, he who blinks first, but yeah, sure, you can use the firearm analogy too, and in some ways it'd be more accurate. But analogously, it's basically he who blinks first loses kind of thing. Um, and it's also a game of nerves that may or may not result in um, you know dead bodies or whatever. So that that's kind of that. You're um, you know in in some ways, uh, maybe this is slightly off topic. In some ways. People who practice civil defiance either were or in some cases even are political crusaders. I've noticed more often than not. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but I've noticed um, I've noticed a recurring trend that people who practice civil defiance, uh, even, the, even if they accidentally call it civil disobedience, which is something different uh, and much more passive, civil defiance is much more active and in the face of the blood, he's like, you know, shoot me, you prick type of, type of attitude. Um, kind of like Sarah Tarrant historically, when she told that that red coat back during the Revolutionary War period, you know, fire on me if you dare, kind of thing with, with his flintlock musket or whatever. Uh, that's more like civil defiance, um, you know. And and it's kind of and and it really is teasing the bear. It really is teasing the bear. And then the only question at that point is: Is teasing the bear really a wise thing, or is it a contextual thing where sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't? You're really just gambling and you know rolling the dice at that point. Um, right, right. You know, see, at least with an assassination market, if you are going to take the state head on, at least you're maintaining the initiative. See, and sorry, one other thing too. This and is you, and and your and uh, I guess most folks are practicing, you know, very good security culture too. And uh, yeah, the only person really at risk would be the assassin, and that's if if they can even find him. So there's there's also uh, I guess the 
anonymity aspect of it too, where if, uh, if it's civil defiance, like uh, some of the events that have, have happened recently, uh, there's no question who was involved. I mean, you know, they all went to trial and shit. Um, so with an assassination market, there's also that kind of anonymity aspect. Well, yeah, I mean, so you have some degree of better security culture, you're maintaining the initiative, and I would argue you actually have a realistic chance of success versus the civil defiance approach where you're a known quantity, there is no privacy because the whole point is to make a big stink about something, and then there's also the likelihood of success measured in any sense of the term success, uh, which pretty much is almost nil and or it can kind of devolve into a soap opera, let's find out what happens in the government courts kind of thing, which is all based on their own laws and the interpretations of their laws. And as old man Rayo put it, laws and their interpretations often change. And it's like, okay, well, at that point, you might as well be promoting jury nullification, all the wonderfulness that that entails. You know, it, it's it's just – and then that's kind of starting to veer off back into political crusading at least to some extent, which is another reason I don't like it. So, you know, if – if, if civil defiance had a better track record and or could be used more efficaciously, I mean, maybe, but I don't know. A posteriori, civil defiance has got some real problems with it. And then when you compare it to assassination markets, uh, you know, it's like, I, yeah, I, I think the one has, has arguably a better chance of success than the other. I think that's just kind of obvious if anybody ever bothered to give it a try. Um, but again, comparing those two different things with the second realm – in some sense, it's almost like comparing apples and oranges because with the second realm, you're essentially – I think there was the old syndicalist notion about building the uh, the new society from within the shell of the old. I guess a modified way of putting that to more accurately describe the second realm is that you're building a new society just completely separate from uh, the shell of the old. I mean you're, you're essentially just starting over. Is really what it is. I mean, I guess maybe mm -hmm, one way of right. describing the second realm that's in the spirit of what the authors are trying to get at here is analogously probably most similar to what some families did when they went during westward expansion. When they were trying to get away from the littered East Coast, which was gradually becoming culturally more and more European, less and less American in any context, whether indigenous or, or the more colonial American, uh, in any context with the word American culturally. Um, and they were trying to you know we need to get into the backwoods. We need to go into the wild. We need to in some and you know, some families were like, we need to act more like Indians. Uh, in one sense or another. There were actually some uh, different uh, discussion for another time, but there were some families who actually in their diaries and records and all that were basically, we need to act like Indians. Some of them we even advocated for uh, intermarriage. Uh, even the phrase, uh, uh, Hakeem Bey even mentioned about uh, there were some tales of like so-called gray-eyed Indians, basically mixed folks who were, um, who had intermarried, the people who were from Europe intermarried with the locals and their children were the so-called gray-eyed Indians who really didn't like the so-called more purebred uh, Europeans who – it wasn't just an issue of genetics. It was also an issue of culture too because the people who were mixed were more like the more indigenous folks who were allegedly purebred in their own sense. So uh, you talk about cultural assimilation, whether that's genetics or a social environment or whatever, that cuts in more than one direction. So yeah, in, in a lot of ways, you could say that part of the American experience, besides the more political part about limited government and the experiment thereof, was also a cultural effort at getting away from Europe, at getting away from authoritarianism, at getting away from these false notions of civilization and really towards something that really is more truly human. Because the problem with empire, the problem with the state, is that it's basically trying to turn humans into a bunch of cogs that serve the rulers. That's, I guess, maybe a, a simplified way of trying to explain the first realm. And so the second realm is is basically the complete opposite of that. You, or as Murray right. Rothbard right. put it, it's the state versus the market. Right? The state would be the first realm. The market would be the second realm. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Let's go ahead and move forward here. Quote, the strict separation and the respect for individual autonomy also implies that we do not needlessly violate the laws of the first realm, but instead either confine ourselves fully to the second realm or live a double life, paying taxes in the first realm and keeping the laws while we are located there and ignoring the first realm whenever we are located in the second. This also includes to not profit from first realm redistribution and, not, and, to, and to pay for the services you consume while there. 
While these might be hurtful suggestions to many arch libertarians, they are not without justification. Such a behavior both protects the autonomy of the second realm and it shows respect to the indiv individual autonomy of first realm inhabitants, even though their autonomy is wasted. In addition, it helps us make a decision to invest into the second realm and move there completely, fully withdrawing ourselves from the first realm. For most of us, the move from the first to the second realm will be a progressive one, a floating scale of radicalization and involvement. Some will stop short for various reasons, bearing the consequences. Uh, end quote. And I'll stop there for a moment uh, because that's uh, an interesting uh, <laughs> shades of gray. It's the shades of gray. You know, I I don't know uh, I don't know how much uh, you know that kind of counts out agorism uh, there in the first realm. Uh, you, you know, uh, uh, holding up the the uh, integrity and uh, autonomy of those in the first realm. And uh, uh, yeah, you know, if you're continuing to do those things, I I I think it would uh, you know. Damn it! I'm sick of paying taxes. I guess I need to get to the. I guess I need to devote myself to the second realm now. Uh, so I it, it's. I guess the the first thing, uh, you know, you know, paying taxes and following the law is not a big fan of, but uh, I can understand where they're coming from because if you're if you're if if your autonomy is violated in the first realm and it's and you care about your autonomy and and, and you're spending some time in the second realm, that will definitely help you, uh, I guess, radicalize so to speak, uh, and uh, you know, to devote yourself to. To, to being fully in the second realm. So that's an interesting suggestion. Well, it's it's also the shades of gray that I mentioned earlier. I mean, even how the authors phrased it, I love how I love the phrasing, a floating scale of radicalization and involvement. That's shades of gray. I mean, for better or for worse, that's that's what they're talking about. So I love that kind of descriptor. It's a much more uh, flowery, poetic way of of describing what of how I was putting it, but we're we're, we're both saying the same thing, right? So some people really can do kind of a more black and white, jump from the one to the other and be fairly okay. Uh, from my understanding of the current, uh, more mainstream cultures, it is most people can't or won't do that. And the only realistic way for many of them, even assuming they wanted to be part of the second realm in any sense, would be more of a shades of gray thing where it's, it first starts as like a strategic withdrawal type of thing in any sense. And then it's a more gradual over time pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, combined with pulling back from the first realm, combined with building, building, building the second realm. You know, as the one goes down, the other goes up, so to speak. Yeah, and it, it reminds me of hashtag Agora. So the, the main character, the guy, and then uh, the main character, the girl, uh, when when he first, uh, I guess, gets on this internet chat and starts talking with these folks, uh, and he meets the girl, and, and he gets kind of taken to, uh, you know, that, that, uh, private, uh, that, pri that, that private back room. His involvement was uh, was pretty much nothing, uh, and slowly as he learned more, his interaction, you know, uh, his interaction and um, I guess adoption of the, of the second realm, or I guess moving towards it, uh, it progressed throughout the book to where he was actually an entrepreneur selling these, uh, I guess, the ghost pads, so to speak, that were not to be confused with Jamin's, but the ghost pads that they were selling in uh, in the book. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, even in that example, uh, in that fictional example, um, yeah, it definitely was a floating scale where as, uh, as the philosophy, as the, the philosophy became clear, as he became more involved, uh, with the, the woman and also the, the second realm, uh, he, uh, you know, eventually, uh, you know, made his way to, to, to mostly second realm, if not all the ways. So I think that's a, a very good way of putting it. Right. And, and, and in some ways, at least with the cultural zeitgeist of, of, and also personalities of arguably most people who come across this, this type of uh, subject matter, it's, it's, it's a lot more realistic that somebody would transition in the way that, uh, Daniel, that character did, as opposed to some sort of expectation that some people could honestly do in some circumstances, especially considering their current uh, lifestyle circumstances and or personalities and so forth, where I guess you can have somebody go from a black and white distinction where they're jumping from a um, – let me just use a little bit of a, of a caricature here – but like a Ron Paul political crusader all the way to a Sam Conk and Agorist. And I guess they can probably do it in like one move, I guess. Um – and if they were able to do it consistently, I guess I would encourage that. But at the same time, is that really like realistic? For mo and see, there's you see, humans tend to, or at least people on this continent, because they are part of the so-called um, enlightened uh, Western civilization or whatever. They're very uh, taken to creature comforts, and unfortunately, many of the creature comforts, in some extent, are subsidized or otherwise regulated and taxed by the state. Um, so if they were, for instance, wanting to become off-grid homesteaders and that was one particular path that they were exploring to uh, – as a form of direct action to try and transition 
closer to the second realm, I doubt they would be they would be willing or even possible in most circumstances to just do it in like one jump. And even old man Rayo was like, you know, Vanu is not an all or nothing thing. You need you you know you kind of it's more like you know yeah, <laughs> it's the journey, not the destination. To use another adage. Um, and and so I think something is like arguably similar here. The the authors of this book uh, of second round book on strategy are kind of saying something similar to Old Man Rayo, where it's you put one foot in front of the other. Yes, you are keeping your goal in mind, but you know you don't need to like kill yourself in in one sense or another trying to um, you know trying to get trying to go <laughs> trying to get where you're trying to go, you know. Right. Right. So, so I guess uh, one more paragraph here for this portion. Uh, quote, to be able to implement such a progressive withdrawal and strict separation makes the drawing of boundaries between the realms necessary. The clearest of these is that our physical and digital temporary autonomous zones and any interaction between only second realm inhabitants belongs to the second realm exclusively with everything else being in the first realm, end quote. Uh, so, yeah, that's just, you know, referring to the se to the, uh, the separation again. Uh, and also uh, back to the digital tazes. Uh, whether that's, uh, you know, the deep web, some uh, market on a blockchain, uh, whatever it is, whatever it is, uh, you know, the second realms can't exist uh, digitally. Well, yeah, of course. And um, I, I bet I bet there would be, you know, some people listening to this who may very well then pipe uh, pipe up, whether they be the so-called preppers or various versions and themes or of it saying, but but wait a minute, if the grid went down, how it is like, no, 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 no there would still be there. Would, uh, hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm mentioning this for a reason. There would still be second realms even then. I guess they would be closer to farmers markets, uh, to use a fictional example, kind of like uh, James Wesley Rawls' Patriots novel. There was a scene in that novel, and this isn't spoiling the ending too much because this was more in the middle of the book, where uh, the main characters were uh, – they're like, what is it, several months to like a year or two or, or uh, deep into uh, the, the apocalypse scenario or whatever. And there's like this farmers market type of thing, which I guess is more gray market because there's no government anymore technically in some sense. Uh, so you can't really call it black market. Um, but there's no like uh, there's no tax forms to fill out and there's no regulations. There's no bureaucracy because there's no government period. So I guess it's gray market by default maybe. Um, but people can trade like whatever and it's kind of a miracle any of these people survived. So that being said, that farmer's market scene was kind of a second realm more or less by default. Uh, in in some sense, and individual autonomy was respected. Uh, there was um, not necessarily a form of adjudication, but there were like witnesses to trades. And if anybody tried any practices, um, let's just say theft wasn't tolerated. Uh, so, you know, the people that had wanted to be there wanted to be there. Um, they had their own security uh, to make sure that everything was was uh, safe and fine and, and all that. So, you know, in some sense, you had like I guess maybe maybe a more accurate way of putting it as a primordial version of a second realm. In some sense, like they kind of had the right idea, just wasn't fully implemented because well, they're dealing with an apocalypse scenario, and they're kind of doing this stuff on the fly instead of thinking it out ahead of right. time. Right, and, and just and, and just so people know, uh, I mean, the, there is uh, uh, as far as I understand it, uh, you know, if there is uh, you know a second realm with say uh, you know 100, 150 people, or however many pe however many there are, 50. Uh, you know, everyone there could set up mesh network nodes, and you could actually have uh, you know a blockchain running on those uh, on those on that mesh network uh, on that mesh network, uh, and you could still use digital currencies. Uh, so you know, as long as uh, you know electricity was provided for and things like that, yeah, it wouldn't be a problem at all. I mean, they, they, obviously with 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 Bitcoin and Monero and those things, you you envision uh, obviously there are a lot of users in there for the internet is kind of necessary, but you can have small localized uh, you know blockchains and such. As far as I understand it, uh, you know, talking to Jim and Baconic and such. So uh, so so I guess that's just kind of a uh, uh, you know I've I've heard that quite a few times before too, uh, and you know the you know the Patriots are. Uh, patriots and menarchists that uh, you know refuse to uh, become involved with, uh, I guess, the the new revolution, revolutionary technology. Uh, and they, oh, and they won't even. And, and as a word. side note, they won't. They won't. They won't, even, they won't even give it a time of day. And plus, it's, it's instantly. I've, I've heard, uh, you know, with with blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, it's it's disregarded outright because it's a path to a cashless society. 
um, you know, digital tyranny. But it's so even speak. worse. And, and sure, those 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 fears aren't irrational. But at the same time, it doesn't it doesn't mean you need to toss out that baby with the bathwater. There's also a lot of liberational ways uh, that this technology can be used. Uh, you know, and and furtherance of second realms well, yeah. and such, and even the infrastructure. For the and as a related, realm. you know, side note, they won't even touch uh, 3D printed guns, which you would think they would like fall all over that, even if they didn't like the rest of the crypto uh, anarchy uh, developments, like blockchain technology. Could they at least get behind 3D printed guns? But I haven't heard. Uh, one bit of advocacy coming from any of them uh, in favor of uh, Cody Wilson or or any of that type of stuff. And it's just kind of like, wow, they were just amazingly absent and silent when he was being persecuted and to some degree still is. You know, that that's... Well, it's, it's it's because Cody Wilson talks about Foucault, and he doesn't talk about Frank. Uh, he doesn't talk about you know Benjamin Frank, or I guess not uh, Franklin, but he doesn't talk about Adams or well, uh, then he's just uh, or Washington or anybody. He doesn't talk about the founding fathers. So therefore, <laughs> uh, you know, he's automatically disregarded. Yeah, and 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 that's just a form of bias, which is which is rather kind of unfortunate because it's limiting their perspective about what's actually possible if they actually did give a damn about human liberty, rather than just restoring some sort of constitutional fill in the blank, which may or may not be coming from a good place. But even if it were, I would suggest it's grossly misplaced as I once did um, and so forth. So that's not so much bashing them. It's more uh, kind of acknowledging kind of where I was coming from at one point and then kind of uh, realizing the error of my ways, so to speak. But yeah, regarding but regarding the second realm and all that, yeah, you're right. Like with the mesh networks, even if there was – oh, that's the other – sorry. Let me mention this before I forget – Without giving away specific examples because I don't want to give undue promotion, there are some post-apocalyptic fictional storylines in some types of unnamed comic books where there is a focus on like the later stages of the disaster where the survivors are basically trying to reestablish – um, there was even one upcoming early access video game, which will also go unnamed, that is focusing more specifically on this element of the disaster uh, fiction, where they're basically trying to reestablish actually the internet specifically because they already got the electricity back up. So what you're saying, real world in regarding like mesh networking could also like reestablish some form of internet and therefore also get a blockchain technology kind of thing going even during the latter part of some sort of uh, quasi-apocalyptic disaster type thing is very much uh, quite plausible if people wanted to do it and that's a very big if so yes uh and, and you'd all you know you'd also have the uh, the programmers or the techie guys there to get it set up because uh you know if this was a uh you know a stereotypical tv show or something like that yeah there ain't nobody there that can set up a blockchain uh, or anything like that. So, so you got to get lucky and have one of them, and uh, and you have have to have one of them surviving with you, so that and, you can and, get that and, set up. Not saying it's impossible, but if uh, you know the the place where you'd learn is the internet. If the not there, then, uh, <laughs> oh, and and what what's what 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 is it? You're you're fucked. <laughs> I guess would be possibly. One way to put it. And just to finish out this this kind of I, I don't I guess related side discussion, I, I suppose. I will say this: whether it's real world or fictional. The so-called preppers or, or, or lovers of doom porn, for lack of a better phrase, they're not Luddites because there's always at least a person, whether it's a fictional or real world thing, that is like a ham radio operator. And that's rather interesting, right? So it's like they can conceive of like that's pretty Luddite. Yeah, that's okay, pretty but to be Luddite but to be fair, to you that. need electricity <laughs> to make that work. And 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 from your stereotypical like preppers, that that is kind of asking a lot in some sense because they're presuming you know uh, a grid a grid down scenario of some kind. But even they can conceive of 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 like ham radio. And rem and as on as historical note. Uh, RIDI or radio teletype was a primitive version of the internet, which was uh, – think of it like texting would be the closest analogy. So it's not completely crazy. Even they can conceive of it in some sense, but they're not going kind of like all the way with an actual reliable internet via mesh networking that may or may not use some form of blockchain technology. They're not putting all those different components together because they are technologically incompetent. Uh, for the most part, at least – let me put it this way. Regarding 21st century technology, because they're still stuck in last century. So I don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, I think a lot of the preppers are kind of stuck in last century, and they're not thinking this century. And um, so I, I guess I guess that's something else to kind of consider too when – uh, when trying to build the second realm in any respect is that whether it be digital technology or some other form of technology, 
uh, yeah, if 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 um, if there are any sort of people who kind of like poo poo it, you have to consider maybe it's not just that they're economically illiterate, which I would also add in as another good possibility. I would also say that they are regarding this century's technology also kind of um, not quite there yet because they're still thinking last century's technology, which would, of course, limit their range of options and so forth. That's all I'm saying. Or, or let me put this analogously, too. It would be kind of like we're talking about using automobiles and they're still talking about horse-drawn carriages. Not that there's anything wrong. Right. Yeah. They're 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 still paying for cable, and you can get every TV show and and live event stuff for right. free online. So not- that's 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 so like that's <laughs> way that's way premature to blockchain technology or anything. Uh, that's so far <laughs> premature. So, uh, so yeah, I think that kind of uh, makes that point very succinct. Yes. 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 It does. And again, not that there's anything necessarily wrong with horse-drawn carriages or cable television. But if you have better options and you have better access and preferably you have the knowledge to make those things work, like an actual automobile with internal combustion engine uh, and or or even electric car, right, or uh, to go another evolutionary step or uh, something like maybe not necessarily like a Netflix type thing, but like getting your your shows for free over the Internet or whatever, um, then it's like why wouldn't you choose the more developed option? If you could, right? So, like, what's the excuse at that point? And obviously, for anybody who's being halfway rational, obviously, if they could, they would presumably choose the more advanced option. All their factors right, being right. equal. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, so I guess that would kind of be uh, all those kind of goes on with the philosophy too. But uh, let's move forward to the uh, the culture of the second realm because, uh, as you guys found out, uh, I guess last week uh, in this book, uh, Smuggler and X Y Z. Uh, you know, culture is a very big part uh, of uh, of the first realm and the second realm. So we heard about it last week with uh, with the first realm. So let's get to uh, the culture of the second realm. Quote: It is easy to understand that the development of our own culture of the second realm is necessary, but attempts to artificially create culture are not 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 are not only impossible but also counterproductive. Culture is a spontaneous order that is shaped by the individuals of a, of a society, reflect, reflecting their individual decisions and mentalities. Nevertheless, there are several things that contribute to the formation of culture. One of the most exciting is the influence of art, music, and literature that springs up from a cultural context and feeds back into it. The imagination of artists often becomes the inspiration to many. It will be exciting to see the creativity in this area. Another influence is that of necessity. Culture encodes and optimizes social interactions, which are shaped by the reality, by the reality that society finds itself in. Specific challenges and threats, but also abundances and blessings of environments, flow into, into and through culture. Compare the longing songs of the desert people with the joyful dances of jungle tribes. Ethical, moral, and religious values are another point to mention. While they are often only reflections of the culture already in place, they also appear in the function of culture founding factors. This is especially apparent in cultures that did not evolve over a long time, but rather rapidly, like much of the United States of America. We'll do one more paragraph here, and then we'll discuss. Quote, the last major contributing factor of new cultural formation lies in the character of the cultural cultural entrepreneurs. It is their boldness, courage, mental clarity, and creativity that sows the first seeds of cultural movements and founds new societies. Those who intend to partake in the formation of the second realm culture should do so with confidence and boldness, but also in mutual support and encouragement. Many experiments and failures will be required before any significant process takes place, and every member will partake in the formation of a new society. Uh, therefore, we must limit ourselves to contribute to the factors of necessity and ethical values in this text, but we cannot refrain to also let our dreams flow into it, end quote. So the culture of the second realm is kind of undecided, right? I mean, that that's up to the individuals there and uh, I guess the cultural entrepreneurs, as they put it, uh, which, you know, I've said this before, but uh, uh, any culture with a state sucks ass. Uh, it's just awful. Uh, not a big fan of uh, not not a big fan of, uh, you know, Western culture or anything like that. <clears throat> Which is why, you know, the things that uh, <laughs> my interests, uh, like, say, metal music, for example, that crosses culture. Uh, you know, I, I love, uh, you know, Australia comes out with some great metal bands, and that culture is very much different uh, than uh, than the one here, uh, at least not, not I guess, uh, count, I guess counting the state out. Uh, Australian culture, from what I understand, is quite, quite a bit different uh, than that of uh, the United mm-hmm. States. Uh, and, you know, there's, uh, you know, different uh, forms of music that come from both uh, different, uh, I guess, versions of metal. 
so yeah, I, I think that's uh, I, I'm I'd be I'm be extremely curious uh, as to especially when when it comes to individuals who have you know autonomy and aren't beaten down uh, by uh, by the uh, the culture at large by that status culture. I, I'd be really curious to see what's uh, you know what developed uh, you know in the second realm. Yeah, exactly. Actually, following on your your example of like musical taste or whatever. Like I've been kind of uh, giving, I've been trying out something called dark country, which is basically kind of merging country slash western music with, um, not not rock and roll or metal, but more of like a, for lack of a better term, more of like a gothic type sound and or lyrics that are more of like a dark fantasy type thing, too. So like, uh, or or actually, you know, uh, even though it's called dark country, the aesthetic equivalent would be what's more commonly known as Southern Gothic. So, uh, for example, TV shows like uh, True Blood, uh, The Walking Dead, would be ex would be uh, aesthetic examples of Southern Gothic. Um, I think there was that movie with Kevin Spacey you know, at one point. It was something along, or in Jude Law, it was the, I um, can't remember the title reference, something about like Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil or something like that. That would be also Southern Gothic too, at least to some extent. Um you know, so that that I think is is something to kind of keep in mind is that there are certain degrees of aesthetics, or shall we say, a variety of aesthetics that can be uniquely part of the second realm as opposed to the first realm. I mean, hell, actually, here let me do something a little bit more concrete. Actually, um, at work, there's always the uh, the warehouse. They always have the friggin' radio on, and sometimes. They can actually turn into the more mainstream country music, which is actually tolerable, at least to some extent. Uh, but a lot of times it'll be kind of the Euro trash or or some other stuff. And you know, I've I've i kind of jokingly mentioned that you know I still think, in so, to some extent, that rap metal as a hybrid genre is in many ways still pretty eclectic because, well. <laughs> If it was, if rap metal was allegedly mainstream, shall we say part of the first realm, even in an aesthetic sense, if rap metal as a hyper drama really was part of the first realm, wouldn't you be hearing on like the mainstream FM radio stations? Because last time I checked, and that's, I've and that's, never heard rap. And that's why ever, not once. Yeah, and that's and that's why I, you know, love metal because it's it's kind of um Countercultural in a sense. I mean, a lot of there are there are individuals, there are teenagers that go into metal because their parents don't approve yeah. of it. You know, it's anti-culture. You know, they're being kind of radical about it. Um, that's not, uh, I guess, the reason I like it. I like it because, uh, you know, everything else is garbage. Me, <laughs> other than, well, old you know, school. classic rock. Well, I like, I like, uh, I, I like my. I like the uh, the artists I listen to to write their own music. I like them to be mm -hmm. talented, and you don't get that with, uh, you know, just as, just as unfortunately, uh, autonomy has been just destroyed by. Uh, by the, the the culture of the first yeah. realm, uh, the the music ability, musical I guess not, maybe not the ability, but the musical um, desires and uh, the quality of said music has decreased so significantly. Oh, yeah. And I sound old when I say that because that's what old people say. Yeah, that's what yeah, um, I agree. But it, but but yeah, it, it's almost like I interviewed uh, uh, Matt Battaglioli, who's the author of uh, The Consequences of Equality, and he has a chapter in there on art. And uh, literally, uh, <laughs> there's this guy who just turned on his recorder and like it's 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 like a 20 minutes i don't remember how long the song is but it has you know millions upon millions upon millions of views on youtube and people are commenting saying wow this is beautiful all he did he lives in like a city he opened his window turned on the recorder and that is art now like that's that's you know demanded music on youtube um wow. and i'm sure he's probably sold it sold it too so along along with with kind of that uh, that destruction of autonomy, that destruction of uh, creativity and innovation, it affects the culture too. Whether it be music, art, um, wh whatever it is, he also mentioned that uh, um, now art, like you can see, uh, like if you go to art exhibits in like uh, you know uh, Los Angeles or uh, New York City, you'll have like an exhibit where it's just a smash bottle. Like someone will just like Jeez. throw it on the ground, you know, move it over there, and that's art. People pay pay a lot of money for this shit. So, so yeah, uh, as far as uh, first realm culture, uh, when it comes to the second realm, you ain't seen nothing. Uh, you haven't. Uh, just as, uh, I guess, economically, yeah. uh, you'll, see, you'll see great products, innovations, creativity, uh, you know, producing things that people need, and they'll pay for them, and, you know, there'll be voluntary trade, and it'll be mm -hmm. all good. But uh, with, uh, with culture, too, with music, with art, man... I I can't even imagine. Well, one of the last bastions, just to come, just to use a side example here on this related note, 
um, you know, one of the few places of like any sort of real aesthetic development, which may or may not be considered a first realm. This is a debatable point, arguably, would be like uh, indie video game developers, not not the big you know, name uh, corporations that sometimes put out decent video games and sometimes don't. But I'm talking about the really like indie, the, the real indie developers. And, um, and, and there is quite a bit of innovation because they're much more entrepreneurial than, um, than, than some brand name cor corporations that I will not, you know, name here. Um, but some, some of those, I mean, and sometimes some of the, you know, it's like any real market, you know, sometimes those, um, uh, at least attempted innovations will fall flat because not everything can work all the time, right? Creative destruction and all that. Um, but then other times something really snazzy goes through. Um, you know, there are certain gameplay mechanics that uh, were very creative and, and have never been done before and thankfully were pulled off right and gamers really responded to it. Um, or, or even if it's just more, even more purely aesthetic in terms of like the art design of like certain levels or, or especially if you look at like, um, more like, uh, like open world style games and how much more, uh, cause now they're kind of going in the direction of like photorealistic instead of like cartoony, like Saints Row was cart was like a cartoony version of it. It's now going more towards photorealistic, like the last Grand Theft Auto, for instance, that that's where it's going. Or even, um, uh, what was it called? Um, Batman Arkham Knight is going towards more photorealistic and, and so forth. Um, that's actually been kind of something interesting to watch is kind of like the further development of like virtual reality simulators, even with something, even with hardware like Oculus Rift or, or other, or other uh, competitors and, and similar like headsets that you wear that and all that. So there's all sorts of innovation going on, uh, whether, you know, it was, I would say probably most pronounced would be the indie video game developers of, of one kind or another. And sometimes they limit themselves to 2d platformers and other times they're, they're, they're doing other, uh, other type of like whether first person shooters or something else. But I've really been kind of, uh, in between other things, kind of like either reading things or watching things. And I am astounded by the sheer freedom they have to try all sorts of things. And sometimes if, if something goes well and the customers like it, those guys make, make some serious bank. And then if something falls flat, you know, but, but it's like real entrepreneurship. It's the damnedest thing. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I definitely agree. So let me read just a few more paragraphs here. Uh, and uh, this is uh, also from the culture section. It goes uh, there. There's, there's quite a bit more to it. Um, but as far as culture specifically, I'm, I'm focusing on that for, for the sake of time and also uh, for, for the sake of discussion, too. And uh, we'll cover some of those things, uh, like adjudication, uh, as, we, uh, as we move forward in the series. So, quote, Respect for property not only extends to the physical territories we occupy, it is integral to the less visible parts of our world, much of which remains unseen to observers. Hidden behind encrypted anonymous digital communication, this connects us and creates another realm where property is privacy. We protect our secrets. We value them. Protecting our privacy becomes second nature to us, liberating us from the prying eyes of our enemies. But our privacy is also a key symbol for the autonomy we live. We are taking back what a totalitarian outer world wants to steal from us. What fences are to atoms, data privacy technology is to bits and bytes. We claim that both are owned by us alone. This is our place. Our places of trade arouse amazement in visitors. As a culture in exile, we have developed unusual practices of trade, with some of us excellent in tradecraft. Be it wearing masks when setting a deal, or blind handshakes to agree on prices, it only covers half of what is going on. Most trades happen in cyberspace, supported by bonds and reputations extending from the merchant's bar, where we meet face-to-face, -to, -face, to the depths of secure digital escrow platforms. Uh, let me see if there's anything else here that I had highlighted. Yep, skipping forward just a bit here. Uh, quote, we are tribes of mind and soul, not defined by nation or race, but by thought and substance. We are everywhere and we are here to stay, end quote. So as a huge part of the culture of the second realm, you heard, that's my, I think that's my favorite quote in this book. We protect our secrets, we value them. Protecting our privacy becomes second nature to us, liberating us from the prying eyes of our enemies. That one, man, like that's, that's amazing. It. Like that's the culture of the second realm. It's, you know, privacy, privacy first. <laughs> we claim yeah. that both are owned by us alone. This is our place. Uh, property is privacy. I mean, oh my gosh, that is so, 
that is a major distinguishing factor between the second realm and the yeah, first realm. Yeah, and, and even if you look at the more kind of moderate, uh, for the sake of political expediency, so-called civil libertarians, language like this from, from the book on strategy makes so-called civil libertarians look rather kind of ineffectual. Right. Because the civil libertarians may make all sorts of noise about, for example, how the ACLU protects privacy rights allegedly or whatever. But then you read material like this and you can tell these guys are serious about privacy. I mean, yeah, to communicate with them, you literally have to go into an IRC chat on ITP. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. And, and even then, you've I, I sat in the chat room for like, you know, days upon days, you know, every once in a while, you're putting in messages. Anyone here? I, I don't know if they have specific times where they meet or if it's just random. I, I don't know, but I've never heard back from anybody. And there are over 30 people in that chat room. So, yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure I'm so, sure they yeah. have their reasons. I I would uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that's kind of part of uh, maybe a sort of uh, a type of vetting in and of itself, too, for other reasons. But, yeah, it's it's let me draw a distinction. Here. Uh, let me draw a, a distinction here, too, regarding the privacy issue. I think this is one of those points of difference between the alternative media and the second realm. Notice how the second realm is very big on privacy, and they even even go kind of even one more step and mention about keeping secrets, like like in the sense of either professional secrets or maybe even other types of secrets. Whereas the alternative media, by its very nature, is all about transparency and kind of has to be at least at least to you know greater or lesser extents because of, because of the type of function that it is. And so it would kind of make more sense based on this kind of dichotomy between privacy slash secrecy versus transparency that political crusaders would be more inclined to co-opt the alternative media for their purposes of basically promoting statism as opposed to the second realmers somehow using the alternative media for their purposes, they don't really need the transparency because they're not all about that. So I guess, I guess, Shane, this kind of makes you and I kind of like uh, the uh, the the for <laughs> the thankfully um, <laughs> the the wonderful outliers, right? Because because yeah, what yeah, what what are their what are their podcasts or radio shows are talking about the second realm? <laughs> Nobody. Uh, it, it's just like with, just like with Vanu. I mean, there's only one place you can get that information. The Vanu podcast. There's only one place you can get a, a whole a whole goddamn series on the second realm. <laughs> that's looking under attack. Uh, so yeah, 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 we're, we're, yeah, yeah, yeah. You and I are kind of like the fortunate outliers in in some sense because I mean, even Alex Ansari kind of mentioned this on our, our listeners are too, of course. But even Alex Ansari kind of mentioned this on on at least a few occasions. Where, um, where like you and I are like media guys, but what makes us different is the type of subjects that we kind of get into and all that. Because we're basically, I mean, I think the thing that kind of makes you and I unique, and this isn't just coming from me. This is also coming from private conversations I've had with with other folks too who have listened to, uh, you know, interviews that you've done with other people or stuff I've done or stuff we've done together or whatever. That we're tackling topics, subjects, and of course, good old fashioned direct action of twenty thousand million flavors like the Freedom Umbrella and so forth that most of the rest of the alternative media is downright ignoring. So right there, that's an automatic niche, and that's before getting into anything else. So I, I think I think that's what's kind of interesting is that the political crusaders really like to co-opt the alternative media because they like the 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 emphasis on transparency, but then they twist it to their own purposes. As opposed to like what you and I have done, where if there really is a need for transparency, we're just we're basically pointing the at the bot, bottom line end of the day, we're either pointing the finger at the state or we're pointing the finger at the political crusaders who are kind of like with substance abuse or so-called or druggies in some sense, enabling the state. Generally speaking, whenever we're doing transparency, like whether it's with uh, like some of the political prisoners and the court cases, uh, their court documents and all that, whatever project we're working on, if we're doing some sort of transparency thing, it's either some form of history and learning from history, otherwise be doing the repeat, and it's already on the public record anyway. All we're doing is just trying to make it, you know, reader friendly in some sense by putting a lot of different pieces together. Uh, sometimes revisionism, sometimes not, depending what the topic is. Uh, we're either doing something of an historical nature or we are deliberately pointing the finger at the rulers and their enablers, the enablers being the political crusaders. Everything else is pretty much direct action and pretty much kind of leading people to the second realm in some sense. Yeah, yeah. So I think another interesting thing to um, to mention here or is to, to bring special attention to is 
just I guess that, that first or second sense of, 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 of another paragraph I read, our places of trade arouse amazement in visitors. As a culture in exile, we have developed unusual practices of trade, etc. I mean, yeah, as, as I said, I, I, the first first realm culture sucks. I don't care if you're talking about North Korea, America, uh, or whatever whatever place you're talking about. And that's that that pisses off a lot of people, wouldn't it? Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, the the, the, the culture of uh, all of the culture is just uh, you know it's it's awful. It's 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 I guess I guess as far as um, you know the the, the propaganda. Uh, you know, that, that people go through and uh, how, you know, the lack of critical thinking, well, that also reflects in culture. Uh, people, uh, you know, most people, you know, when they hear, uh, you know, blast beats or uh, or off time metal stuff, they think it sounds awful. But it's because, uh, you know, they you know, that it's, it's, it's complex stuff. It's complex stuff. So, uh, again, uh, <laughs> uh, the culture definitely has an impact on art and uh, first realm culture. Yeah, not fun. That's uh, that's quite awful. Yeah, but it's also the type of values or, or shall we say at the risk of sounding like an objectivist, uh, the anti-values that they are promoting, right? I mean, even if you, yeah, okay, here's a fun homework assignment for anybody who, I, I don't want to sound like Tyler Durden too much for anybody who watched Fight Club or read the book, but if, for anybody who wants to do a homework assignment, consider this. Actually, not just listen, but read the lyrics to most of the common uh, like Euro trash style like pop songs. Uh, whether it's a Rihanna or, or you know, pick, pick somebody who's really, like, establishment approved, okay? Uh, first realm approved. Yeah, and they don't write their music, by the way. Fair. That's true, unless they're, like, a designated singer or songwriter, which is... No, that's that's not that's not a defense of them, <laughs> I'm just saying. You know, like, they <laughs> they pay people a lot of money to write these shitty okay, lyrics. Okay, yeah, but, but, then, but then, like, actually, like, really pay conscious... Don't just, like, casually absorb it, like, in, into your subconscious or whatever, because that's what's actually happening. No, consciously pay attention and really think about the lyrics. Like, I'm the only girl in the world. What does that mean, I'm the only girl in the world? No, seriously, I'm not joking. I'm not... This may... With my tone of voice, I may sound like I'm joking. I'm honestly as serious as a heart attack. What does that mean? I am the only girl in the world. And the rest of the lyrics, not just of that particular song, but of any of these songs, where um, there's also another one that keeps playing on the main FM radios when I'm at the warehouse, something about, uh, like, I want to see your body naked or or something to that effect, but it says it, like, over, it's, like, part of the main chorus, so you hear it, what is it, seven, eight, nine, ten times during just one play of the song, never mind when they play it and replay it and replay the replay. And it's just like, no, I don't want to. And I, you know what I said one time, actually, on the main floor of the warehouse? I said in my loudest voice, I said, no, I don't want to see everybody naked because not everybody's in good enough shape to be seen naked. <laughs> Some people are actually in very bad shape. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's getting into personal preference. But I made a point about it, and a couple people laughed about it because they know I was commenting directly against those mainstream pop lyrics. I mean, that's how asinine it has become, ladies and gentlemen. Right, right, and and I would even uh, you know you know further say that uh, um, the the culture of the first realm not only uh, it kind of reflects the not only reflects the I guess the intellectual needs of its uh, of its uh, audience, but uh, it also whether it's uh, movies, TV shows, whatever it is, it provides unrealistic ex expectations. Uh, so, so when people grow up watching, uh, you know, Disney movies and they see, you know, the princess, so they're waiting for their prince, you know, this is perfect relationship. Everything's great. And that never happens. It never comes. So, so what you have and, and, and culture feeds into this so much. I, anytime I, I sit down to watch anything, it's, it's there, it's there, but it breeds these, un, these unrealistic expectations, uh, which then, you know, leads people to live, uh, you know, in large part, uh, uh, unhappy lives. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, not only is that uh, you know unfortunate uh, you know that they're not happy, but it also I suppose I don't know that that definitely has an impact on 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 people you know uh, um, being you know willing to willing to you know to fight for their freedom whether that's uh, via direct action or or other means. Um, it's uh, <laughs> yeah uh, I think that's kind of what the state wants, right? I mean uh, you know the you you have uh, I think the mainstream culture and the inter entertainment avenue is just uh, uh, another arm of the state at least to some extent well of course so, well of course uh, it is it's certainly unfortunate. well of course it is to some extent and that's not even counting more specific examples like the pentagon putting you know uh, propaganda placement ads you know for the national guard and like mainstream movies or something um like like consider one thing too like polyamory 
regardless of whether you like it or not, polyamory in the first realm culture, the mainstream culture, is still considered pretty countercultural even today in early 21st century America. Oh, yeah. Polyamory is not the norm. And not only is it not the norm, more importantly, whenever it is brought up, uh, whether you're for it, against it, or just being good old fashioned neutral like it's done I am. so quite disparaging. Oh my God. Goodness, even what there was even one conversation I had with one of my coworkers at the warehouse because he was explaining about all of his he went on and on just over the course of the day short shorter conversations about you know uh, about his various you know failed romances and he even tried cheating on a spa long story for another time but basically there was a kind of long series of stuff and at one point I was just trying to kind of shut him up so that we could you know he would stop you know being annoying because I was trying to be polite about it and I said well have you considered polyamory the second I said that he just went almost ballistic on me. And that's and I think that's kind of indicative of of, of the mainstream culture as well is that oh, yeah. the assumption is it's not even so much monogamy or marriage versus not it's not even so much that it's it's more like a serial monogamy I think might be the most accurate way of describing what the mainstream culture expects where you kind of hop from lover to lover but you're only doing one at a time and it sure as hell ain't you know, for a lifetime or close to it or until death do you part. It definitely isn't that either. So that because that's more the kind of Judeo-Christian model. It's not even that. It's more serial mana where you're basically just bed hopping. But as long as you do, you know, one lover at a time, then it's OK. That's the acceptable compromise, don't you know? Just just, just make sure you're only sleeping with one person at a time. Because, of course, there's also the medical reasons, too. They'll they'll kind of throw that in there and try to make it sound pseudoscientific in some sense. So they'll take some true things about STDs or pregnancy if you're heterosexual or whatever, and they'll kind of mix it in to try and make the more, dare shall I say, cultural case for serial monogamy. And then that becomes the norm, and then you have – and then because of how all this stuff seems to work and out. And you have 50 percent divorce Bingo. rates and, uh, yep. and, and, and all of these, uh, these, these, these really awful things. And by the way, in a lodging way for any men, <laughs> uh, there's an argument made about that too. Uh, so you guys have mentioned that book a few times. Go read it. It's free at interplex.org. Yep. Or interplex.net, actually. Uh, I'll put that. I'll put a link to that in the show notes because I've mentioned it so many damn times. And I've actually been marrying some articles at Liberty Under Attack, uh, some essays by James Farber and such that uh, – uh, you can find the, the link there, too, just libertyunderattack.com. It's the, the last post that's up there. One of the – you'll see it at the top of the page. Okay, so Kyle, let's uh, let's begin to close out here. So, so, so in this episode, we've talked about the philosophy and the culture of the second realm and also kind of how that differs from uh, the philosophy and the culture of the first realm. Uh, and and it's, it's it's certainly quite different. Uh, uh, the philosophy and the culture portion of the second realm, uh, not only are they, are they liberating, but, uh, you know <laughs> – Human creativity and innovation uh, aren't, uh, you know, restricted or regulated by uh, by those who falsely imagine themselves to be our rulers. Uh, uh, people can, uh, you know, live free, and uh, uh, it's 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 going to be quite quite impressive, uh, you know, uh, whenever uh, you know we get to our second realms, and uh, uh, we can kind of see this philosophy and culture in action. Uh, it's going to be a, a really really beautiful sight. I, I know it for sure. So, uh, I guess, uh, uh, what are your closing thoughts? Well, my closing thoughts are that. You know, in in some sense, the um, you know some some of the better, let's say, at least in my life, at least as it is today. You know, and sorry to bring up the warehouse for the twenty millionth time this episode. I'm sorry, my bad. I'm actually drawing on real world instead of you know comic books for the twenty millionth time, right? At least recently, in recent months, right? Um, in in a sense, there's already kind of a emerging ethical enclave slash counter economy slash second realm even at the warehouse regarding certain types of activities that <clears throat> take place after official business hours so um you know that's another reason i don't mention the name of the company either uh but but yeah it's it's you know i mean that that whole gray sometimes even black market activity is uh you know isn't very much in keeping with with agorism with vanu or as is the case with what we're talking about tonight the second realm and that particular version of it that, you know, I've been very fortunate enough to <clears throat> I'm not gonna incriminate myself, but let's let's just say I, I have some knowledge of it and leave it at that, um is 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 wonderfully freeing. Um and and oh by the way, that sorry, let me point up may, let me mention something more of a psychological nature uh, of sorts that I've had to kind of almost help some of those uh mm, traders with, is some of them actually feel guilty. Uh, like they're acting like because they're still kind of stuck 
and they're 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 still controlled schizophrenics, but they're getting they're not as bad as they were before because well they had me around thankfully I, I I like to think I had something to do with with helping them feel less guilty about it, but many of them felt guilty um, about I think I told you before about I think I've mentioned this publicly before about the whole donations thing and all that, um, which is which is really about really more about saving a trip to the food pantry because all of that stuff was properly allocated because those of us that actually do that kind of thing. Uh, those who those who do that kind of thing, we're responsible. You know, we're respecting property rights, and quite frankly, <laughs> management could give a crap about the investor's property, which is kind of another problem altogether. Um, but at the very least, for the grunts, uh, you know, we're respecting property rights. We already know the stuff can't is not allowed to be sold. Actually, ironically, a good portion of it is because of uh, the state's uh, insistence on uh, following the laws reg regarding expiration dates. Interestingly enough, even when such expiration dates are even as far as like a month out, sometimes under some circumstances, they'll actually prohibit uh, the company from actually selling it, which is interesting. Therefore, it has to go basically to the equivalent of the homeless people. Um, so I guess the certain mar certain version of a uh, gray market activity is is then made possible, at least that one form of it. Um, you know, and 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 if it's that, or even some other forms of more gray market activity, which I've been kind of experimenting with, and uh, involving a use of actually a kind of a self issued barter credit type thing, which maybe I'll save that for another time. Whatever type of activity is, one thing I keep noticing over and over and over and over again, and I think this is more pertinent to the development of the second realm more generally is if your traders, your participants in the second realm are still, as they're transitioning towards the second and away from the first realm, if they're still feeling guilty about their trading activities, even though this is something they want to do, I think there is a market demand for, I don't want to say counseling services, but basically some sort of... <sighs> Essentially, a a bolstering up, a a kind of um, I don't want to say a pat on the back. Yeah, and instead of instead of, instead of the I guess the first realm beating people down, building people time, up. Yeah. Um, I guess building people up in the second realm. Yeah. And, and and saying like, hey, you're doing nothing wrong. Like, yeah, sure, we have as the Venuans would call it an ethical enclave, or the Agoras would call it the counter economy, or as is the case here, a second realm, uh, whatever whatever term you're using in whatever context. You know, you're doing nothing wrong. You're you're exercising your individual autonomy to the extent that you can and or are willing to, and you shouldn't feel bad about that. So the social conditioning by people who are transitioning away from the first realm towards the second realm, I mean, even Rand mentioned about the sanction of the victim, which is very much what I've been seeing, is is the full flowering of that when somebody is resisting their social conditioning. Actually, interestingly enough, has nothing to do with principles or, or or any sort of philosophizing, but it's more due to a more utilitarian necessity type thing because it just it's more an issue of like paying bills and such. And I've in my own interesting role has been more like, hey, you're doing nothing wrong. We're respecting. I, I kind of give the spiel, which many of them already know this. I'm only just kind of tying, you know, connecting the dots, so to speak. But the end product is now all these months later shall we say, our uh, gray market participants, almost none of them feel guilty. And I would like to think I had a significant role to play in making them at least feel better. So I, I know there have been some uh, libertarians who shall go unnamed here who like to talk about uh, relational anarchism or whatever other terms, and it's all about right side of the brain, emotions, and, and whatever else. And I think in the past, on past episodes or whatever, I think I've expressed, uh, or, or sometimes even in private conversations, expressed my uh, <clears throat> reservations about that kind of thing. But I don't know. It's kind of like in some sense and almost in a roundabout, almost accidental way, uh, I've kind of had to find that sometimes if I try to make people feel better – about stuff that I rationally in my left brain knew was perfectly A-OK -okay stuff, um, if they feel better, then a lot of times they're more willing to actually keep on going and doing that stuff that they were initially kind of feeling bad about uh, because their emotions – because essentially their social conditioning was – they were – their, <laughs> their social – they allowed their social conditioning to manipulate their emotions about something that even their left brain knew was A-OK. -okay. And all I'm doing is saying, right. ignore your social conditioning. Your emotions are all haywired anyway. Let me let me let me suggest something to your left brain, and hopefully your emotions will play catch up. 
<laughs> is, I guess, maybe a roundabout, roundabout right. way of putting it. So same thing here with the second realm. Whatever second realm activities uh, people are going to participate in, I wouldn't be surprised if there's going to be some degree of emotional resistance and or some sort of guilt, maybe even shaming to some degree that they may feel, even if it's only internal. And I would just suggest that maybe a good prescription for that might be some form of, if not counseling, at least encouragement. Let's call it encouragement because I can't think of a better word for it. I think encouragement would be good. Like, hey, you're doing nothing wrong. If anything, you're actually doing the world a lot of good by following your own self-interest and exercising your individual autonomy. Not And, and not only that, but not only keep doing that, uh, actually, wait, hold on, do more of that. <laughs> Yeah, go farther. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think that emotional component being manipulated by the social conditioning is something to not ignore, but instead try and find solutions for, even if it's just encouragement from other second realm uh, traders that, uh, hey, you know, uh, you know, this, you know, this is these are our principles. This is why we're doing this. And we're going to keep not only keep on keeping on, but we're going to do more of that and so forth. I, th I think that's the closest thing to a solution that I have for that. And again, this is not. Yeah, we're yeah we're get, keep keep doing more, and and not only that, but uh, you know, develop the culture. You know, help develop the culture of the second realm. This, uh, I guess, this newfound individual autonomy. Although it's not newfound, it's just been uh, neglected and and uh, you know, literally beaten out of a lot of people. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, you know, build build this uh, th this culture of respect for person and property, uh, and uh, actually live free. Uh, so yeah, of course, yeah. of course, and you know that that's kind of something to be you know to be kept in mind. So I understand that some people might have some individuals who shall go unnamed will you know can have expressed about you know feelings this feelings that we need to have you know anarchic schools of thought based on right side of the brain or whatever, and that that may serve some purposes maybe. Um, I guess that is a debatable point. All I'm saying is that. If you want to have people transition to the second realm, don't be surprised if at some point during their shades of gray transitioning, they start feeling guilty. And if so, if that does pop up, just give them a, an encouraging word or two. And, and a lot of times that will make all the difference in the world. And in fact, that might be one of the more efficacious ways of actually b of growing the second realm even quicker and more sustainably is just a kind word here. You know, a little bit of motivation over there, uh, especially if somebody's feeling like, um, like, oh, I'm not supposed to be living freely because how dare you live free in America kind of thing or anywhere else on planet Earth for that matter. And so, yeah, I mean, that's and sorry. That's another thing about the second realm, too, is that it's it's recognizing that humans are social animals and and the value of social interactions. Therefore, a word of encouragement if somebody's feeling down like a particular day is also kind of reaffirming the culture of the second realm as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So, I guess I, I don't, I don't really have uh, have anything else. Uh, uh, is there anything else you like to leave the listeners with? I would say, you know, there's there's a lot more content in in the second realm uh, book on strategy by X Y Z and Smuggler. Uh, you know, if folks want to read it, you know, please do. And or as you're listening to these LUA episodes, follow along with us. And, uh, you know, also also trying to kind of make sense of it with other things you've read and, and you know, look, look for the uh, look for the integrity and then also look for the contradictions and make up your own mind. Um, and, and that's the other thing. Oh, let me say one final word about the political crusaders regarding the second realm. If anybody was going to demonize the second realm more than anybody else, it wouldn't even be your authoritarian left or your totalitarian right uh, mainstream uh, crusaders. It would be more. It might be a it might be a modern inc inc incarnation of uh, Sam Conkin calling uh, calling second realmers retreatists or something like that, which would be unfortunate. Or at the very least, it would be your oxymoronic anarchist politician flavor of political crusading, uh, where they're they're just people who say one thing and do another. These would be folks from like the anti-libertarian libertarian party or other versions and flavors thereof, where essentially they're just enabling statism. They claim to be against statism. They claim to be against authoritarians. They claim to be against uh, the ruling class of any flavor, but really at the end of the day, they're just enabling it because bottom line, what it is is just reformism. It's it's uh, uh, reforming the reform of the reform of the reform, which of course produces no real solutions. And in fact, like old man Rayo correctly pointed out, 
uh, the current uh, tyrannical situation is actually the end product of failed uh, or sometimes even worse successful uh, political crusades of the past. So that's 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 yes. just kind of the bottom line there. So that that's kind of something to keep in mind. So what I'm saying is that for folks who actually try to develop the second realm, don't be surprised if some of your current role models who are more insistent upon democracy and elections than anything else in terms of doing anything are some of the first critics and repudiators of the second realm just don't be surprised i'm not going to name names here just going into the future keep your you know keep your uh keep your eyes and ears open and see who's promoting ethical ethical enclaves and or the counter economy and or the agora and or the second realm versus people who are demonizing it wholesale as people undermining our democratic form of government or, or the Federal Reserve System or whatever uh, horrible tyrannical thing they're promoting this week.